Good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Brooke Muller. I'm the Dean of the College of Arts and Architecture at the University of North Carolina at Charlotte. And we are so thrilled that you are with us this evening. Um, I do want to give some props to the jazz ensemble who produced that beautiful music. Um, very thankful for the for the work of Professor Will Campbell. Um, and we are honored to have Harvey Gant with us, Mayor Harvey Gant, and a group of excellent and engaged COAA students. Harvey, we are so grateful for your interest in spending time with us. Um, as many of you know, Harvey Bernard Gant was the first African-American student admitted to Clemson University. He graduated with honors in architecture, earned a master's degree in city planning from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, and then became a founding partner of the Charlotte-based practice, Gant Huberman. He entered local politics where he was elected to city council and then elected to two terms as mayor of Charlotte from 1983 to 1987. His impact on this community is deep and wide and will be very, very long lasting. I remain taken by uh, Harvey's comment during the Charlotte American Institute of Architects Women in Architecture Breakfast last October. In a panel moderated by our very own professor of urban design, Deb Ryan, Harvey shared his dream that Charlotte becomes a laboratory for people learning to live together. Motivated by this aspiration, I ask what can the College of Arts and Architecture do as a vibrant learning community to work toward this dream and what are the implications for arts and design education? How can we as creative thinkers ignite the civic imaginary and work toward necessary social change. A couple of items before we begin the conversation. First of all, we welcome your constructive comments in the chat. We will record and utilize these as we engage the COAA community this year and beyond. And also we hope there will be time for questions from the audience toward the end. And lastly, some thanks are in order for the team that has helped put this event together. Dean Adams, Elena Payne-Weens, Meg Whalen, Rhonda Latham, Sam Salvato, and top flight production manager, Ben Stickles. Now, before I turn the floor over to Harvey, I'm honored to introduce four amazing students who will in turn introduce themselves and share a few brief remarks, remarks about their experience in the college. And we'll start with Abina. Hi, everybody. My name is Abina Atimo. I am a student here at the College of Arts and Architecture, specifically architecture. I am a junior with a minor in Women and Gender Studies. I am also a student ambassador here at the University of Charlotte, North Carolina. We'll go to Renzo now. Thank you so much, Abina. Well, hello. My name is Renzo Cáceres. Um, I'm a student in, in the music department. Uh, I'm a music performance major. I'm a junior this year. And well, I'm, I'm, I'm originally from Argentina. That's not like a fun fact. <laughs> but um, I'm really excited to, to be here today and have this conversation with uh, Mr. Gant. Thank you, Renzo. Um, Jalen. Hello, I'm Jonas Mullet. Uh, I'm a graduate student in the program here in the Arts and Architecture program. Uh, I'm just really happy to be here today. Thank you so much. And Cecilia. <clears throat> Hi, I'm Cecilia Whalen. I'm a senior a dance student and French major here at the college and here at UNC Charlotte. I'm a Charlotte native um, and I'm very interested in this conversation and excited to hear um, this discussion about the arts and social activism and social engagement. Thank you, Cecilia. And Harvey, I think we turn the floor over to you right now. Uh, thank you, uh, Dean Muller. Um, first of all, uh, good evening to all of you uh, students and to the wider audience. I'm actually delighted to once again be a part of the program of the College of Art and Ar Architecture. Uh, my history is that I go a long, long way back, almost to my time coming to Charlotte in 1968, um, I'm next 65, but getting involved with what was going on in that school 
of architecture at that time. Uh, as a young architect, uh, all the way through uh, from 65 to 68, and then subsequently later on, from 1971 on. Uh, as I thought about what I'd say to you in these few brief remarks, it occurred to me that all of you are students and essentially starting your careers in the arts or in architecture. Uh, and I sort of went back to examine how I got there. Uh, what in fact led me to a career that dealt with the creative arts? Uh, and why was I attracted to people who were involved in the visual arts, the performing arts? Uh, what, what, what drew me there? And I remember this tale of a, it's not a tale, it's a story of a fifth grade teacher who I still remember to this day, uh, who uh, recognized something in me that I didn't realize I had. Uh, she, uh, she penalized me one day for, for uh, not paying attention to what she was saying in class. Uh, and when she came over, she found out I was sketching and literally sketching people in the classroom, drawing portraits of the prettiest girl or uh, a flower vase on the windowsill in the classroom. And she said, you're not paying attention. She embarrassed me before the entire group and uh, kept me after class. And I often tell people today that was the turning point in my life because she started, she, my punishment was helping her to assemble the Thanksgiving uh, bulletin board uh, using my skills as a person who could sketch very well. I didn't recognize I had that talent until she pointed out that I had that talent. And uh, from then on, I've always wanted to be close to the arts. So I sang in a choir uh, and finally uh, ended up with architecture as the pursuit that I wanted to have. And I've often wondered and asked people, why are you doing what you're doing? Why are you studying music uh, or studying the arts or studying some particular thing? What drove you to that particular point? So I look forward uh, to this conversation as we continue, as I continue my kinship uh, with UNC Charlotte's uh, arts program and its architecture school. Uh, we have drawn and we have been to many lectures there. We've participated in many over the 45 to 50 years we've been related to each other. And uh, my firm has profited uh, by getting many of the uh, uh, graduates, uh, over well over a dozen graduates that worked in our firm and are leaders even today in our architectural community. So I have a kinship here that, that has been lasting and I'm looking forward to this discussion uh, with you very, very smart students. Thank you so much, Harvey. So let's, let's kick it off. Um, <clears throat> there's so many things we could talk about right now. I know, Renzo, you had a question about working toward change, like what can students do to practically to now? We know that it needs to happen. We know it needs to be substantive. And so what is the role of the student earning an education right now in contributing to the process of um, societal betterment and change, and more, perhaps more particularly, the role of the artist. Mm -hmm. Yes. So, yeah, when when I got invited to this conversation, I was like, "What can I ask?" And and something that well, I've been noticing that reading about everything uh, in the world going on right now is the the world is is crying. We want to change, right? The, everything that's going on, protests, and everything is just the world wanting to change. And so my question is, I feel like every person has a different idea of how to change in their lives. Um, some people might, might say, I don't know, I need a routine, I need uh, loss, I need, uh, I personally think that change comes in a spiritual way, uh, but how can we take those ideas and translate it into a cultural change? How can we basically change society? Renzo, mm -hmm. that's a good question. 
and I would ask, before answering, giving you my answer, I'd like to know what you think needs to change most. Oh, um, I personally think is, well, th this is um, how I, I, I was taught since, since I was a kid that we're not exactly the same. God created us all different but he, he created us like that to teach us how to love other people. So I personally think that, that the world needs to learn how to love other people, how to love each other. It's more about like relationships. Um, that's what's going on right now in my mind is, is what I'm thinking about is we, we're crying for equality, we're crying for uh, justice. And, and I totally agree with that. But God created all the, the differences, all the diversity, uh, which is so beautiful, just to teach us how to love. So I think that's something that, that the world is, is needing right now. That, that, that is absolutely a great statement, mm -hmm. uh, teaching us how to love. Uh, I'm a Christian, so I, I believe in the most important dictum that Christ gave us was love your neighbor, mm -hmm. uh, love your neighbor as you love yourself. Love God first, love your neighbor. Amen. And to, to get to that question you raised, or what can you do? Uh, the first thing, and it seems to me you're not going to have trouble with that, is you have to have some courage. The courage to want to see things change. And it starts with, with the people you associate with and the people you are around. And, and the courage that you might have to express yourself in terms of what you believe and, and how you think things ought to go forward. And even more importantly, how you will use your education to in fact accelerate and move things uh, forward in your life. Uh, I lived in a time when we also thought change should come. This was a time when, when segregation of the races was uh, actually the law in the South. And uh, some of us got together, courageously, I would say, and in high school, the year before I entered college, and we said, you know, we can do something about what's going on right around us. And so we organized a group of folks, 27 students started out integrating, sitting down at a lunch counter. And that created a whole movement in the city of Charleston. Remarkable thing is that we did it without telling our parents because we knew that they would hold us back because they were concerned about maybe our safety and our ability to complete our education and uh, go on to college. But we were more concerned though, about the wrongness of segregation, the, the lack of ability to just have a Coke and a hot dog at a downtown department store. Those were the issues back then. And it took a lot of courage. We started out with about 40 some students, only 27 went because uh, the others felt that they, they couldn't withstand what would happen to them. I would say to you, if you see some things that need changing, speak up. And I think you start with the smallest circle, the students that you're around. Uh, one of the things that I've been proudest of in these recent protests is the diversity of the students young people that are involved in stepping up uh, on this issue uh, of George Floyd and, and others who have been brutally killed by policemen. Uh, I, I, I think that that suggests to me that there is a, a lack of tolerance on the part of a lot of young people today to want to see the world continue in the fashion that it has, particularly as it relates to race and other issues. That's too long an answer, but Courage oh, is what I, what I ask for and speak up with your friends starting there about how you feel and try to influence how they, they are acting. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. um, I have to say a couple of things. People you associate with, Harvey, people you are around, the students you are around. And Abina asked a question about just um, students of color and white historically and predominantly white fields and what that means and what we can do. So I'm going to let you take it away, Abina. 
Yeah, my question was basically just because you were one of the first African American people to be admitted into Clemson. Um, that was a space that wasn't necessarily designed with you in mind. And so for students of color going into predominantly white spaces, you know, what kind of advice can you give to them who are experiencing forms of discrimination, um, bias within the classroom, just anything that could impede the studies that they're there to do? That's a very interesting question, Amina. Uh, I, I started out uh, with a great guidance counselor in high school who advised me that I should go to school I shouldn't go to the traditionally and historically black colleges. Uh, and it was based on the fact that 99% or more of the architects in America were white. Uh, and you need to find out what it is that they're learning and to understand that world. Um, I might have a slightly different view today, but that's what led me to Iowa State University and then ultimately to Clemson, this notion that if I was going to practice architecture, I needed to practice uh, with colleagues that I'd have to work with uh, in my career and in building my firm. Uh, and I went into that space, as you might say, not recognizing it then as a white space, but as a, but as a place populated by white students with their own backgrounds and et cetera. But I had to be Harvey. I had to be me in that environment. Now, it was very important for me to be a good student, but to question and to design whatever the problem was based on what my tapes were of my past and what, who I was as a person. Because design has to come from the gut, in my opinion. It, it, has, to, it has to reflect who you are. Uh, and I actually enjoyed the opportunity to, to work in that, quote, white space uh, and, to, and to deal with students who, fortunately enough for me, respected me. Uh, and I assume by, by definition, respecting my race, at least in those classroom settings. And so when we, when we got a problem, uh, I was always looking at it in terms of what would that new house look like in the neighborhood I came from? Or what would I, how would I design that school based on the schools that I went to in the segregated South? And what kinds of things I would add to make it special for uh, the clients I perceived that I was working for, uh, designing for? Uh, you have to make your own space. But, the, but also the most important thing to me, because uh, you know, I was called a pioneer, particularly at Clemson, was that I had to make sure that I graduated. I had to, I had to get the work done. I had to deal with the rigor of the academic curriculum. And so that was always first. Uh, but, but, but as important was being me. I just, I just had to, I, had, I always felt comfortable being me when I, when I worked on a design problem or a design issue, or looking at problems in a social context. So when, they were given, when we were given assignments and projects, I always had interpreted it in the context of what my life experiences have been. Does that make any sense to you? Yeah, yeah, very much, very much. Thank you. I was wondering, going off of that, do you ever had any mindsets or decisions or possibly even regrets that you didn't go to uh, HBCU instead of going to PWI? Like, do you feel as though there's some opportunities that you missed not going to a historically black college or university? That's a great question because a lot of my friends when I was deciding to go to Iowa State said, what, you got accepted at Howard and Tuskegee and other places, what are you doing going way out there to the Midwest? And I'll tell you what, on days when I was at Iowa State and, and the temperature was 23 below zero, I often thought of how nice it would be to be in Alabama or to be in Washington, D.C., where it was a much more friendly client, uh, climate. I, I, but, I, but I also thought of it another way. Uh, because of that predominance of where architects, my profession, were being trained, perhaps I should, I should be one of those students 
who found out what the secret sauce was for them and what was going on there. And I saw it as opening up opportunities of choice for African Americans. Remember, we were living back then in a time when our choices were very limited. Uh, and as proud as I am of those schools uh, that I have been accepted to, those HBCUs, they still exist today, and I'm proud of that, and they're turning out architects who are doing a good job in the profession. But I also felt as if I was opening up opportunities at a place like Clemson or North Carolina State or UNC Charlotte, where you all are. And so you can look at it both ways. Now, their environment was a little bit more comfortable than mine. Uh, I, didn't, uh, I didn't have as many options for just some of the social life that occurred. But that was a sacrifice that I don't think is nearly as pronounced today in those schools as it was back then being the only one of 7,000 students who was black. You would be interested in knowing though that my wife, uh, Cindy, who was also a graduate of UNC Charlotte, was the first African-American woman at Clemson. And uh, I was attracted to her and she was attracted to me and we, we got married and we've been married now for 56 years. I see you laughing, Brooke. Uh, did I say something wrong? No, I said something delightful, actually. I met my wife in the uh, stairwell of the architecture building where I studied. Aha. Uh -huh. Yeah. And, uh, and so actually, the story is, so I was like, who is that? And it turns out we had this class together. And I sat toward the back and she was a couple rows in front of me. And I'm like, I got to figure out a way to get her attention. So I was that guy who asked the really long question that actually wasn't a question, just so I hoped that she would turn around. And you would think that would backfire completely, but actually it's, it turned out it worked. So that, that, that was pretty nice. But you're in this you know, intense educational environment and you just make relationships and ours, ours is not nearly as long lasting as yours. It's 21 years strong as of just a couple of days ago, but we're very, very good. We're happy. Um, I should say on that question of, of uh, African Americans in architecture, at least the current issue of architectural record is in fact, uh, uh, gives a huge part of its uh, publication this month to African-Americans in the arts and in, particularly in architecture and some of the issues that are facing the profession in general and issues that deal with um, what the social contract ought to be with education, architects, and what's going on in the community right now. Uh, how involved uh, should you be? And I think Renzo started to ask that question about, you know, what is it that we ought to be doing? Uh, you're not existing out there at UNC Charlotte in a vacuum. There is a whole lot of activity going on. And the question would be, what role should a student play in some of what we see? I don't know how many of you participated in the protests, and I'm not trying to, to grade you one way or the other, whether you did or not, but how much are you paying attention? And I think you have to pay attention. Uh, you have to pay attention very closely because one day, whatever it is that you do, if you're a visual artist or a performing artist or um, someone in architecture, you're going to have to be involved in that community that helps to make society a better place. Thank you. So I have a question from Malik Norman in the audience, and I'm going to link it to Cecilia's question. I hope this isn't too much of a stretch, but what roles or programs can institutions like ours as a university play in economic mobility? What are some programs of that art and architecture could be put into action? And I think in some ways, Cecilia, you're kind of flipping it. You're asking what role the artist can play in governmental system. So I, I want to hand it over to you. And again, I hope I'm not mixing up the questions too much, but um, they seem somewhat related. Sure. So um, obviously, right now we're having as a nation and as a world, but especially in the United States, we're having all these conversations about 
how our systems need to change based on the Black Lives Matter movement, as well as the coronavirus epidemic, we see how our systems were weak to begin with and are now crumbling um, anywhere from education to healthcare, right? So I think it's been pretty evident in the past as well as the present on how, on the role of the artist in activism, we've seen that downtown just with the Black Lives Matter mural itself. So we see how often how the artist plays a role in activism. My question is, does the artist have a role in the system or should the artist live outside of the system? Should the artist, is there a role for the artist in government or does the artist, should the artist exist solely outside of government as a way to push the systems forward through an outside force? Mm, that's deep. Um, mm. uh, let's see if I can get at it this way. One of the great things, nice things that I thought happened was the Black Lives Matter mural down the middle of Tryon Street, one of our more sacred spaces in this community and the heart of how Charlotte has developed into this uh, growing uh, metropolis uh, on business. And yet we had that mural go down the street and there was absolutely consent on the part of the government to allow that to occur. Uh, I worried for mo just for a quick moment that the Department of Public Works would send out a crew to, to scrub that very clean, um, but they didn't. I see artists and murals now all over walls that send messages that I think are, are, are good. I think those kinds of uh, contributions are, are peripheral and important. I shouldn't even say peripheral. Uh, they are important, but I, I don't think you, I, I think there will be a lot of what you do that is in, which we shall, shall we say in the private arena. But for me, there is a very important role that the arts can play in government too. A very important role. Um, and I'm not talking just about some, some uh, things like hiring uh, artists to paint murals and to do sculptures and because that's important. And Charlotte has a robust uh, public arts program for its major projects. And uh, I was happy to say that I helped to, to bring that kind of thing into existence years and years ago. Uh, but, but in the context of cities being places that uplift people and stretch their horizons, uh, I, think, I think that the artists the architect, the creative individual does have a role to play and government sometimes, if they're good, recognize that in many ways. So there's an appreciation when my firm designs the Beatty's Ford Road Neighborhood Library that we not just simply design a box with some shelves in it, but to have some image of young kids who might not have as much exposure to books coming into an environment that makes them want to read and want to spend time there, unsupervised, just reading and exploring. Uh, and that the building itself created an interest in wanting to do that. And maybe even asking who conceived this, who designed it. Uh, or when we did a building like Imagine On, uh, the idea that there was art in that and that there was thought given to the design and things to delight children, to make them feel good and to remember that space, a space that they might not have had the opportunity. Government brought that about in, in, in a lot of ways by deciding to hire architects who were creative. And um, Joe Riley, the mayor of Charleston, South Carolina, often tells the story and some of you, if you've ever heard him speak, will we'll, uh, we'll remember it. They have built a beautiful park in Charleston. It's called Waterfront Park. And it's a wonderful space with uh, fountains and uh, uh, dockside venues. And it is just, it, it, it's just a major investment by the city of Charleston in that space. And Joe said he often got criticized because we were using public taxpayer dollars 
uh, uh, to do something that was a labyrinth. And Joe tells the story then, uh, well, let me give you an illustration of why it was so important for us to do this wonderful part. He said, there is an old gentleman in his 70s, that would be my age or somewhere, who comes there every day in his retirement and he just sits there. And he's there every day like clockwork. And someone asked him why he was there and he said it was just beautiful. It was a great place to reflect. And Joe's point was, had the government not had the sensitivity to create or help to create a space like this, a space that this gentleman would never be able to afford on his own, or a country club setting that he could never get into because of his income and his status. The public sector provided an artistic, creative environment that uplifted him as an individual. Uh, I often talk about memorable spaces in cities. Uh, that's so important for uplift, in my opinion. And that has to come from artists. That has to come from architects. That has to come from landscape architects and people who appreciate that. And that's that that gift, that service that you present and you that you develop is accrues to the benefit of the entire community. So there is a reason and, and there is a good reason for seeing art uh, as an important aspect of governmental life. Of governmental operations and systems. I'm, I'm sorry. <clears throat> My goodness. I've got I'm some... talking too long. You're not asking enough I... questions. I'm, 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 I'm talking too long. Go no, ahead. You know, I, there's some questions on the Q&A, but uh, if there's a panelist who'd like to follow up, um, please do not hesitate. Or I can go. All right, I'm going to go. So Malik Norman, who asked the question about how, what are some programs for ec the role of arts and economic mobility. So we, we could talk about that. Um, actually, let's talk about that. The role yeah, of the, yeah. I don't know about the role. I don't know about the role of arts and economic mobility, but I was in a meeting the other day in which we were all discussing this whole situation of poor people and affordable housing and how much money we can put toward building nice affordable housing. Uh, and one of the questions that some of us raised was, what about poverty in our community? What about poverty in cities? What about all the homeless people? And how can we afford, how can we uh, accelerate uh, people up the economic ladder? And, you know, Charlotte has had this as a big issue for the last couple of years. And we've been, we've been 50th out of 50 cities in terms of economic mobility. Uh, and again, I'm back to the point that creating an environment that lifts people up is most important, starting with education and good schools and being willing to sacrifice and pay the dollars in taxes to build the best public schools and to hire the best teachers. Um, but I asked the question in that meeting because I didn't see a lot of CEOs of the big companies around and I know that they're out there and they're, they're interested. One of the ways that we solve the problem or begin to solve the problem of economic mobility is to pay people more money. If you had more money, and you, if you could afford to put food on the table and to afford the rental on a, on a decent place to live and afford uh, uh, to at least contribute a little bit to building up a savings or owning a house or, uh, or building some wealth. It all really starts with wages. And if uh, we started to pay the people who flip our hamburgers uh, $15 an hour, $18 an hour, that's a sacrifice to somebody. That somebody is us, those of us uh, who are consumers 
of hamburgers, for example, because we might have to pay a dollar more for the hamburger. But how good is it that we know that the flipper of the hamburger is making a salary that, that will allow him not to work three or four jobs, but to spend some time at home with his children, to give some guidance, to buy that iPad that they need, to connect to the internet. Uh, all it requires is some sacrifice. Now, someone loses. If you're gonna bring about systemic change, it is not a win-win situation. And that is what a lot of people have difficulty with. It is not a win-win situation. When, when, when the company ABC raises its wages across the spectrum of its labor force, who loses? The shareholders lose. In a sense, they don't get as much dividend as they did before. They don't make as big a salary as they used to before. But the all society might benefit. And if companies would think more of their responsibility beyond the shareholder to the stakeholders, we can begin to change society and cause much more movement on that economic ladder. But the bottom line is money, money that allows a person to get a better education, money that allows them to deal with basic things that they need right now. And that, the only thing I can see right now that we can do that would make an appreciable difference in the lives of so many people is to allow them to make more money. You know, I have a colleague, Harvey, who is an economist at Reed College in Portland, where I moved from, named Noel Netzesil. And she studies gentrification. And my colleague, Carlos Cruz, would say that's a nice word for displacement. And what she says is you don't want to keep neighborhoods down. Like, you don't want to. So, oh, let's not invest any money in this neighborhood because there, then you're going to have gentrification and then people will be forced to leave that neighborhood. What she says is you need to subsidize people at the same time you improve those neighborhoods or you have to, fig you have to figure out a way that, such that they have the resources that enable them to remain in those neighborhoods. So That's only exact. I, I agree with you. I agree with her. Um, it, 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 it is a... It is a difficult problem for us to overcome because it's, it goes against the system yep. that we've perpetuated so much in America. Um, uh, and, 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 and government is a bad word all over the spectrum now, whether one's liberal or conservative. Uh, to have the government do something to subsidize those neighbors you're talking about. If we're going to have gentrification, they should be in a position where they've got the economic power uh, to, to sustain themselves, even in the face of such changes that, that occur. But as long as you say pay somebody $8 an hour, you're going to always be trying to find a way to build more affordable housing. And even there, you can't get to where you need to get to. I drive past an interchange every day, and I see a settlement of homeless people living in tents. Uh, we don't have anywhere to put them. I can't believe our society can fail us that way. Not as smart as we are in America. We, we ought to be able to do something about that. Uh, and sometimes it means we've got to do something that means that we sacrifice. Those of us who are in middle and upper income positions have to sacrifice. The billionaire can't be happy about a tax cut that he didn't really need to have. Or if he makes two or three less billion dollars a year, but that money is gone to some useful purpose. It is not a win-win situation. It is a win-lose situation. The poor at the bottom ought to win, and those of us at the top ought to lose a little something. I agree completely. Anand Jiradaradas would writes about that. He's this amazing thinker. I just finished reading his book, Brooke. Winners, yes. Yeah. I, 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 went to, I told him that uh, he is, he's been influencing my thinking lately, but He's really funny too, but he's brilliant. He yes, he is. So any, I do have a couple of questions. Cecilia, I was thinking about the question that you asked about the current state of Charlotte rel relative to the conversation we're having. And, you know, we used to have your own high school experience, which you've written about quite eloquently 
and maybe we could, um, maybe you could ask that, that question. Well, sure. Um, to your points and um, our previous discussions today, um, bluntly, compared to when you were mayor to now, um, how much has Charlotte changed in terms of race relations um, as well as integration in general? And um, like um, Dean Muller said, the impetus for this question comes a lot from my own personal experience. Like I said, I'm a Charlotte native. I went to East Mecklenburg High School, um, which is a very diverse high school, although it is still in a city that I believe is um, 50%, almost 50% minority, I'm not sure I have my demographics wrong, but we're still, East Mech was still overwhelmingly uh, minority students. But even so, compared to the rest of the schools in Charlotte, many other schools in Charlotte, we were a very diverse school. Um, and that totally shaped my whole life and all of my friendships. And that's been a super important, the most important experience of my life. But that is not the same experience that many other high schoolers and middle schoolers in Charlotte had. I know Abina went to Rocky River, right? Which was, is an overwhelmingly minority school as well. And when I say for those who are not Charlotte natives um, or who have not had experience within the CMS school system, when I say overwhelmingly minority, I mean 90% plus minority in a city that is not, <laughs> that, and that does not represent our city at all. And it is on the other side as well, 90% 80% white um, schools as well. So that is long winded to say that our school system remains segregated. <laughs> How does that, so in some ways our, our society is perhaps as segregated or more so than in, for example, 2000, the year I was born, when um, the schools were, became, le became more integrated and then suddenly in 2000 became resegregated. So in a way, um, parts of our society seem to be more segregated, but I'm sure obviously parts of the society are more integrated. So I'm just interested in your perspective um, as former mayor, um, what, how do you view this? How do you view Charlotte today compared to yesterday? Excellent question. Uh, we could probably spend the rest of the hour talking about it. I'm trying to see how I can condense it. Um, when I raised my children in Charlotte in the 70s and 80s, they went to schools that were, as my conservative friends would say, socially engineered. Uh, and a little yellow bus achieved that. So the city was just as segregated as it is today almost. But they literally took children from the black community and children from the white community and bust them across town uh, to allow them to have a measure of diversity. Uh, so my children all went to school at uh, Piedmont Middle, you'll know the one I'm talking about, and uh, Irwin Avenue Elementary, and East Mecklenburg High School and West Charlotte High School. I had two kids that graduated from East and two that graduated from West Charlotte. And it was almost, uh, it was, you know, Charlotte was very proud of that. They weren't initially, the young attorney back then who I knew very well, who carried that case all the way to the Supreme Court when he, when he, when he was victorious, you know, people threatened him. His house had been bombed previously, and they didn't want to see that kind of thing happen uh, in Charlotte. But thankfully, there were parents there that said, we've got to obey the law, and they engineered the, the desegregation of the schools. They carried out the, uh, the, the dictates of the court. And it existed from the middle 70s all the way to 2000. In 2000 or somewhere around in that time, what happened was a court suit occurred 
and, and the judge at that time uh, said the schools were sufficiently integrated. Therefore, we don't need to bus anybody anymore. This is a personal reflection. It was one of the most ridiculous decisions I'd ever, I'd ever seen because the neighborhoods had not changed. And all of us, many of us predicted that the schools would end up being resegregated again. Uh, there were efforts made to, to overcome this with special funding for schools that had 90% African Americans or schools that were in low income and marginal neighborhoods to address that, this, but there was not much in the way of adjustments and changes um, that were made. And again, it's back to economic conditions produce uh, different outcomes for different families, black or white. So I, I, I would say that I went to school in the, uh, the feel-good era that occurred between uh, the mid-70s and the year 2000, when Charlotte, with a population of 23% uh, African Americans, elected me as mayor, uh, and we did a lot of great things with regards to planning and development, and passed about $2 billion in bond issues for expansion and development of the city. But all along, what we did was still artificial in one sense. Uh, someone has to win, someone has to lose. And, and, and we were trying to make sure everybody won. And people did lose. Uh, Low-income families that are back in situations where their kids are not being properly educated uh, I think is, is, is a problem. But those low-income families, with people who are going, with parents who are going to two and three jobs, or, or, or parents who can't get married because they, they can't afford the, the cost of marriage, uh, because their wages are too low, their training is insufficient to exist in the 21st century economy. Now we you know, what, what we're seeing now is, is a reality that expresses the need to get to the core of the problem. Back then, we artificially fixed it for a while, and it worked to the benefit of a lot of students. I thought my kids, I purposely made sure my kids went to the public schools, but they went to schools that were integrated, that they did have a chance to see both poor and wealthier students. And it was a great experience and they all turned out fine. But I come to recognize that that is not the final solution to how, it, I don't wanna use that term, that is not the real solution. And maybe COVID-19 and the recent social protests across this country will allow us now to grapple with what we need to do. Because in one sense, the same lawyer that caused the busing to occur and had that great victory back in the 70s said to me before his passing that, Harvey, I feel like we're back in the 60s again. We're back to segregated schools, and we seem to be going backward. And my only thing to him was to offer some hope that maybe my children, who got a chance to go to school in those halcyon days of the 80s and 90s, would not allow this to go much further. I didn't realize that we we're going to come to the period we're in now, but perhaps this is a time for you, you young people, to act to begin to change this environment totally. I actually appreciate Cecilia for bringing up that point because like she said, she went to East Mech, I went to Rocky River. Um, schools like Rocky River, East Mech, Garinger, and Charlotte are you know, greatly affected by students being displaced. Um, and just personally being an architecture major, I just have to wonder like what can an architect do to help situations like gentrification and displacement and just like, you know, gerrymandering, these, these large concepts that almost seem like above us, what can someone in a singular profession do to kind of aid this kind well, of Well, 
you can run for public office like I did years and years ago to try to influence public policy. But if you don't want to do that, you need to step out and speak up at the forums of in the forums of government as to what's wrong and what you see wrong. Architects have been accused of being reluctant to be in the public arena for years. And I've preached this sermon more times than I care to think about, that as long as we are not there, we are not going to be other than, we're only going to be the people who decorate the solutions. Um, and, and, and while that's an important role, I shared that with you, that I think our spaces have to be wonderful and good and all of that. Uh, I do think that we have to influence public policy by speaking out that we need to be courageous. We need to step up, even though in many cases, particularly in architecture and the arts, uh, our clients are the patrons of wealth. I mean, they, they, and they in fact are our patrons. They are our clients. And many of my friends, my colleagues have said, I can't speak but so loudly because what you may be talking about in the end is a redistribution of wealth. You may be talking about uh, changing some things that are systematically in place and have been entrenched for years. But I don't see how we influence not only the social issues, but how cities grow, how communities grow without being activists and in front of those people who set public policy. So I hope when you get out of this institution that you don't decide to chain yourself to the drafting board or to the uh, sketch pad or, or to how you develop sculptures. I, I hope you see beyond the room and get into a bigger room. Abina, I would just wanted to say the economist that I mentioned in Portland works with this nonprofit called Mercy Corps Northwest. And what they've done is purchased like these strip mall developments from the 50s in these economically marginalized, ethnically diverse neighborhoods, and they renovate them. They um, allow local businesses to locate there. And then if you live in certain zip codes, you can invest $10 a month, 25, 50, 100, 200 a month into these projects. And then once the nonprofit's able to pay off its loan, they basically give the project over to the community members who invested in it. And so that's a drop in the ocean, but there are these emerging finance models. And my encouragement as an architecture, emerging architect would be to work with people who follow the money, like Harvey's been saying. And you, I think there's some really innovative opportunities there if you work with the right people. They're actually crowdfunding buildings in the city of Portland right now because people, they want to see like their investments have, they, they're less concerned about a rate of return and they're more concerned about seeing p beneficial um, community impact. They don't uh, take loans from banks, they broker with building yards and they avoid the middleman. So there's, uh, there are these exciting models, but we need to be conversant in those languages in order to have our work make the greatest difference. Definitely seems like Portland is the place to watch. Um, that's my birthplace. So, um, you know, there's always been, there was a lecture that we had my freshman year where they were talking about the, the pod initiative where they created spaces for homeless people um, and they checked the zoning and things like that. And so um, just, I know that it's out there, but just trying to, to make the wider community aware of these kinds of things, that these are sustainable things is really like something we have to consider kind of changing gears to, I believe. Totally. And we need to find our role models. I call them kindred spirits like Harvey. We need to find our role models that we can look to, to, to help inspire us to, to work towards change. I had a question for Mr. Gant, um, listening to all the, the conversations that we were having. And he often, you, you often mention the role of family, parents, talking within economics and education. And I personally think that, that over the years, like I, I talked to my parents, for example, and they, I've been blessed with them because they, they're always present and they have this influence in my life. It's a positive influence. And I know that, that over the years, the, the, the government or the system has 
maybe take that away from people. Uh, even do you say that, that there are parents that are working two or three jobs and they're, they don't have time to be at their house. Um, and, and I don't know, I wanted to, to know your, your point of view on the role of the parents in our society. Uh, and also for, for us, we, right now we're focused on uh, as a students, what we can do, but someday we're going to be parents. And uh, personally, I want to know like what, how important um, and, and how to influence in my kids' life and how they're going to influence society too. Uh, I, I don't know if that makes sense. No, I think that's, that's a good question. In fact, I'd like the other students to uh, chime in on what they think the role of a parent ought to be because you're all going to be future parents in some way, shape, or form. Um, my model has always been my parents. Um, my, my, my parents have had a great influence on my life. Uh, and yet, you know, if you think about it, back in the 40s when I was born, <laughs> which would for you seem like ages ago, um, uh, my father had less than an eighth grade education. Uh, and my mother finished 11th grade. She didn't graduate from high school. But I don't know what got into them. They, they, they actually believe in as oppressive an environment as they lived in that the promise of what this country could offer their children was real. And they wanted to make it real. And, and they figured out, even with their lack of formal education, they figured out that education was the key and that they needed to pay attention to how we did in school. And, and, and my dad used to say to, uh, my dad was a laborer, uh, and he used to say to his colleagues at work that he was going to send all five of his children to college. And... <laughs> And he said, Harvey, they used to laugh at me. They thought that I was pipe dreaming. And I guess in the vernacular of today, they might have asked him, what was he smoking? Uh, but he stuck to that belief that his kids were going to go to school beyond high school. Uh, they definitely were going to go to high school. And they stayed after us. And the way they worked it out was my dad worked two and three jobs, but my mom was the monitor of how we were doing in school. She watched over us when my father had to work all those jobs, which is, pro which is probably why you hear me say it quite a few times tonight, mm -hmm. that until you allow people to have decent wages where they don't have to work two or three jobs, uh, we're not gonna get ahead. In our case, they just split the responsibilities. Mom, mom monitored the house, dad brought the income in to make sure that they'd be in a position later on in life to do with them. So they influenced us. They influenced us by what they, what they tried to accomplish in those meager circumstances. What they had was a spirit that said we can do. And I, and I think we have more resources. Today. Even the poorest of us have more resources than maybe some of the uh, people who lived near the poverty line back in those days. Um, I do think, and I've seen this, and this has nothing to do with income level, I do think as you, as you develop your careers, you do have to spend some time with your children to influence and pass on positive values that, that you want to see them have. So if you get too busy as an architect, professional, or an artist, and you're spending all that time, you're going to look up one day and all your kids are going to be grown, gone, and mad at you for not giving the time. And so you do have to spend some time sharing what you think and passing on what your values are and getting into those arguments that I'm sure you've gotten into when, when you as a teenager thought you really knew a lot more than your old fogey parents. Um, but, but those are necessary things that have to be done. You would have the privilege because you're likely going to be graduates with a degree and maybe a nice job uh, you, you may think that parenting will just come natural, but you'd be surprised how your time can be eaten up and you, you might not spend time with your children. 
uh, I'll tell this story and I'll shut up. Uh, when I was mayor of the city and practicing as an architect, they allow you to do that in Charlotte. Um, uh, my second oldest child, uh, who was a graduate of East Mecklenburg, Cecilia, uh, she, she had a habit of uh, tackling me when I tried to go out the door to attend a city meeting or something. And this was her way of saying, why are you always going? And it drew my attention to the fact that while the other kids didn't express themselves so openly to my absence during that terribly busy period in my life, she didn't mind telling me that she felt that the, the city was taking away from her time with her dad. And uh, that caused me to change my habits and decide to turn down some things in order to spend more time with my children. You have to be careful about that, but that is something you've got to be attentive to. So we have, we're an hour in, we can go a little bit long. Jalen, I think you might have a question and then we can, there's one last question from the audience that I'd like to share. So patients, audience, we're, we're gonna wrap in a few minutes, but I, I know Jalen has something to say. Hmm. I wanted to ask a question based on diversity. Uh, usually when it comes to universities or even high schools, diversity has always been key importance, whether it be financial, racial, or social. Diversity allows people to have different opportunities to open up their understanding of the world and people around them. But at the same time, with uh, court decisions based on affirmative action as well as Boop versus Texas, how do schools best try to integrate diversity like University of Charlotte in the School of Arts and Architecture without creating a system of tokenism where we're not really creating diversity but just collecting just different people to say that we're diverse? That's a big mistake. Uh, if we're just collecting people that make the class look like a rainbow. Um, I still think you have to have students who have the capacity to do the work. I know that universities are now using lots of different measures to make sure they're getting the best students. Um, and, and what I mean by that is things like uh, written exams are probably becoming less important, not as important an indicator of whether or not you will be successful in school. And I think those schools that, that really are wanting to be diverse will look at those measures. And then when those, those students get in, um, they're not treated as appendages or, or just tolerated, um, making sure that they feel comfortable in the environment so that they'll have the chance to be expressive of their own creativity and, and abilities. Uh, is, is very important. And, I'm, and I say that even when we talk about uh, where you're going to ultimately work one day. Uh, we have a lot of diversity inclusion programs, what we call DIP, DIPS, existing across the uh, business spectrum now. And the ones that are most successful, in my opinion, are the ones that genuinely are, are, are intentional about their recruiting and, and, and making sure that they are open to what that employee, future employee or student is going to, to do in that environment and how they will contribute to making their firm more successful. Uh, again, another story from my background. <laughs> uh, Gant Huberman was one of the most diverse architectural firms in the state for all the years of its existence, almost. Uh, and that's partially because obviously I was a principal in the firm. But we were intentional about going out and looking for uh, architects and engineers of color and women. And uh, we ended up with a firm that was very, very diverse at our peak, about 55 professionals uh, with a high percentage of women and minorities. Uh, in fact, coming into our office, it looked like the United Nations. So some of my white colleagues and other firms said, Harvey, how did you do that? I mean, you know, we can't seem to find them, T-H-E-M. Uh, and the, the answer to that was, uh, how intentional were you in finding them? Uh, it is easy 
when you have a vacancy to simply say, we have a vacancy for an architect and take the first two or three people that walk through the door. And so you're never going to change the environment. You have to be intentional. Firms that are intentional and mean well and see the value of that diversity are the ones that succeed. So it is that it was a business proposition that paid off for us because we could send our architects into lots of circumstances where their experience, their background, actually served us well in, so, in, in coming to a design solution. Uh, we did that all across the Carolinas. Uh, uh, when we needed a person of color or when we needed a woman we thought that could understand and appreciate a certain situation, we could, we could in fact do that. And I think that became very beneficial to our firm's ultimate success. Fantastic. Well, I'm being intentional, not only about hiring in uh, the profession, but in higher education as well. Absolutely. So I'm going to ask one last question. Um, it's Malik again. It's this fantastic photography student. And I'm going to combine it with Joe Skillen's question. He's our fantastic new department chair for music. And so Malik asks, where do you find your bliss? And Joe says, I wonder if Mr. Gant would be willing to offer some of his sources of artistic and design inspiration. Oh boy. <laughs> what inspires me to design the buildings I've designed? Uh, what inspires me to, uh, to always be the optimist in the room to, yeah, I, I never heard anybody say that I was blissful, but um, I guess it's just a belief in your inner core of who you are. I don't think you can do anything without really feeling comfortable with yourself. I think a lot of me, I don't think less of others because of that, but I think a lot of who I am and who God created me to be. Uh, and every morning I look in the mirror before I go out and say, Harvey, be Harvey, be upright, be honest, express your feelings, never allow a situation to occur where people misunderstand where you are and what you're about. Uh, when I'm designing a building with a client, I'm going to try to ask all the right questions, but I've got to make sure it fits with what I think I can give them yeah. in terms of a solution to the problem that they have. And I want them to understand how I approach that problem. And hopefully it's in, not in conflict with the way they're looking. If it is, if they're looking at it differently, then we discuss that and we discuss it thoroughly before we even accept the commission. Uh, but uh, I think you got to just be comfortable with who you are. You can't be anybody but who you are. Uh, and I talked earlier about bringing that perspective that I bring. Someone once asked me, asked me well, uh, because you, are, you, you really come from Africa, you, what is the African approach to this problem? And I swear I didn't understand that. I could only deal with what my tapes were, what I grew up with, what I understood about space, what I didn't like about some spaces, and what I would design to overcome those things I didn't like. Uh, so uh, it's, it's being you. It's really being, it's all about you in that sense. Being you and respectful of others, but being comfortable in your own skin and who you are. Wow. That's a fantastic way to conclude this session. Thank you so much, Harvey. Thank you, Renzo, Jalen, Cecilia, Abina, for your time so much. We um, had a question about the book that we have both read. It's by Anand, A-N-A-N-D, and Jira Dardas. Don't ask me to um, spell it's called, it. It's called Winners Take All. Winners Take All. Yeah, and it's, it really is relevant to so much of what we've discussed this evening. Um, Harvey, belief in your inner core. You said earlier, you have to make your own space. I remember going to architecture school and I'd go to one class and they'd impart certain lessons. I'd go to the next class and they would contradict what the previous professor said. And I said to myself, you all need to get in the same room and figure this out. And then I realized it was about my story and I could take this and I could take that, but I had to construct my own story. And that was yeah. the Amen. Of education. Amen. So 
thank you so much. Um, this has been a joy. Um, we'd love to have you back. We know how busy you are, but this is, I'm getting emails about how wonderful and chats about how wonderful this is. And it truly has been a, an honor for me. Thank you. Well, thank you. And, I, and thank you for allowing me to be with these wonderful students. Uh, I wish you all the best in this very different kind of year. We will all remember 2020. Mm -hmm. More importantly, what the, the, the thing will be, what did we take away from 2020? Yeah. Yeah. We're hoping to get back on campus October 1st. So remember, you gotta, we gotta treat, we gotta treat each other well. We gotta care for one another and we can pull this off. Okay. All right. Thanks everyone. Have a great evening and talk soon. Take care.